begin, let's have a brief word of prayer. Father in heaven, we invite you into our presence. Lord, we know that our service, our worship is all about you. Father, we ask that you will lift up our thoughts, lift up our hearts, and even our eyes towards you. I pray that what we hear, what we experience, what we see, will be what you would have us to do and hear and see. Father, I pray that you will bless each one that they will be touched by your word and inspired as well. Father, I ask for myself that that you will grant me the words to speak and that you will help me to present it humbly. This is our prayer for we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. When's the first time in your life when you heard about the second coming? I know the first time when I heard about the second coming, it's very distinct in my mind. I grew up in New Jersey where I attended a a Korean church, and the Korean church happened to have rented a a large uh, Catholic cathedral. At least in my mind, it was pretty large, and and at the time, I thought it was like St. Peter's, this grand, magnificent uh, structure. Looking back on it, it probably wasn't as as large as I thought and as grand as I thought, but in my mind, it was much larger. I remember in that building, in the basement of that building, and I was a primary student at the time, and my my teacher, Sabbath school teacher, mentioned uh, something to the effect that Jesus is coming again for the second time. So I naturally asked her, when did Jesus come the first time? I didn't know. To that, my teacher responded, a very long time ago. And in my adolescent mind, I tried to uh, uh, grasp the meaning of a very long time ago. What does it mean that Jesus came a very long time ago? And I finally concluded, oh, Jesus must have come in the 1970s. (laughs) For me at the time, I thought that was a very long time ago. (laughs) The teaching of the second advent or the second coming has always been a very prominent teaching in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. It was one of the five pillars in which our church was founded upon. And even as young children, we are taught this biblical teaching. It's even in our name, right? Seventh-day Adventist. I remember during my seminary years, um, one of my professors, Dr. Richard Che told us a story when he was younger. I think he was in his teenage years. He said one time he went with his mother to the, to the bank for a loan. And I don't know how long this loan um, period was. I think it was 10 or 15 or 20 years. It was an extended period of time. That detail doesn't matter as much. But as his mother was about to sign the promissory note, they naturally looked at each other and they both smiled. They knew what each other was thinking. In their minds, they were thinking, suckers, by the time this loan matures, Jesus would have come by now and I don't have to pay the loan back. (laughs) Needless to say, that loan didn't mature and they had to pay the money back. We as Adventists, we had this strong belief in the soon coming of Jesus and we seem to have our own estimation of when that will be. Did you know this Wednesday was October 22nd? It is 2014 at the moment, at least I think it is, it mean, which means it is 170th anniversary of the Great Disappointments. That's quite a bit of a long period of time. On October 22nd, 1844, William Miller incorrectly predicted the second coming of Jesus using Bible prophecy. Its conclusion was based on Daniel 8.14, where it says, after 2,300 days, and the sanctuary will be cleansed. William Miller assumed that the cleansing of the sanctuary was a reference to the second coming, where the Bible says that Jesus would cleanse the earth by fire. So he assumed the cleansing of the sanctuary was a second coming. 
His message was spread very quickly, far and wide, by preachers like Samuel Snow, which was prominent in the pre-Advent movement for, for preaching and uh, the, uh, preaching the Advent message. In the Northeast, William Miller's message was the most widespread, and it is estimated about 100,000 followers were awaiting ascension on that day in October 22nd. Many left their possessions, some left their farms fallow, some even forego marriage, and there were even rumors that some had made white ascension robes. So when Jesus had, would come, that they were already dressed with their clothing. But when October 22nd, 1844 came, those who believed assumed that he would come at noon. So noon came and went. Obviously, Jesus did not come. And I kind of wonder, how did they come up with the conclusion of noon, East Coast time, right? Why not West Coast time or Pacific time or Mount, Mountain Standard time? I don't know. Maybe there was some element that God, that God was hiding or shielding them from certain, certain uh, information as to prepare them for uh, something else. But we do know that, that when noon came, Jesus did not come. And someone else concluded, maybe it's 6 o'clock. So they waited until 6 o'clock. And 6 o'clock came and went. And they waited and they waited and waited some more. Someone finally said, hey, maybe it's midnight. After all, there's some parables that talk about the master coming at midnight. So maybe Jesus will come at midnight. So we'll wait. And they waited and waited and waited. Until midnight came and went, but Jesus did not come. And because Jesus had not come, all those who were waiting for Jesus were bitterly and awfully disappointed. So what happened? Miller had meticulously studied the Bible, so what went wrong? And Miller himself was sure that something was supposed to happen on that very day. He knew that the Bible could not fail. So why hadn't Jesus come? He based his prophecies on Daniel 8.14, and he determined that 2,300 days had its fulfillment on October 22nd, 1844. But here's the problem. The problem was that he had the right date, but the wrong event. Or to put it another way, he had the right day and even a really good understanding of the prophecy, except he had the wrong application. Do you remember the 12 disciples? In their lives, they made a similar mistake. They believed in the coming of the Messiah, but they had some wrong assumptions that, that they made about the Messiah. But it wasn't just the disciples. Almost every Jew believed when the Messiah came that he would come conquering and that he would set up a, a secular, a civil power, earthly kingdom. Their personal ambition was that the Messiah would also remove the strong yoke of the Roman Empire. The disciples correctly believed that Jesus was the Messiah, that they had correct. And can you imagine what it must have felt like when Jesus finally made his triumphant entry into Jerusalem, riding a donkey? This was an image that, that, that the Bible had pre-shadowed, and, and this was a part of prophecy. And, so when, and here comes Jesus, riding a donkey, triumphantly entering Jerusalem. Now their hopes were even more heightened it seemed to be a fulfillment of prophecy and even their own expectations. People realize this. And they're waving palm branches. And they're yelling, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The son of David was actually a, a title for the Messiah. So, so they're expecting Jesus to, to soon take the throne of David. And even from a secular point of view, if you, if you think about it, Jesus would have made a pretty good king. Think about this. Now, Jesus could read people's thoughts. So what 
person could lie to the king. If the enemies came, if they lied to him, he would know right off the bat, right? He could read their minds. Or if, if they went into battle, they need not take a, a, a whole uh, uh, army full of food. They only need to take five, one basket with five loaves and two fishes, right? Because he fed the 5,000 that way. Why not feed the army that way? So they will be super mobile. They only need a little bit of food to feed the entire army. And someone got injured, they will bring him to Jesus and Jesus will just put his hands on them and they will be healed. Or if someone even passed away uh, in battle, Jesus would say, bring them here. And Jesus would say, uh, come forth like he did with Lazarus. And the dead would rise and they would be, fight again. Who could stop an army like this? Not even the mighty Romans. And they see all this and their ambitions for Jesus to be king is now heightened. The problem was, they had the right person and the, even the right events, but the wrong application once again. They had some wrong assumptions of what the Messiah and who the Messiah would be. But this did not take away from the fact that, that this event was still highly significant. That, and it did not change the fact that this prophecy was fulfilled in Jesus. They had the right person and the right events. But when Jesus was crucified, guess what? Their hopes, their dreams, their expectations all shattered. And it would be a huge understatement to say that the disciples were greatly disappointed. They were bitterly and awfully and terribly disappointed. It was probably the lowest point in their life. They were devastated. But did you know that there were many other f followers that Jesus had? But of all these followers who had the same expectation of, uh, that Jesus would be the Messiah, how come they weren't bitterly disappointed? Maybe we could say that they were mildly disappointed, but it was really nothing to write home, home about. Think about it. Some of the very same people who moments before who, who were yelling Hosanna to the son of David, the very same people who are, who are wanting him and wanting to make Jesus king, these are not the exact same people yelling crucify him, crucify him at his arrest or after his arrest. To have changed their position so quickly tells us their mindset that, that they got over it pretty quickly and pretty easily. But why were the disciples so greatly disappointed? It was because their joy was great, and so was the disappointment when that joy was taken away from them. You see, for three and a half years, spending time with Jesus was their entire life. And it was the greatest time of their life. The joy and fulfillment that they received was unequaled. They were moved and inspired like never before. They saw things that they had never seen. They experienced things that they thought were impossible. They were taught by a man who taught like no one else. And Jesus Love like no one else. Because their joy was great with Jesus, without him there was a great disappointment and sadness. It is the same reason why when we meet or hear about a stranger who, who has passed away, we don't mourn it the same way we do when we mourn a family member or, 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 or a close friend. It's because our friends and family members, they have brought meaning to our lives. They have brought joy and love into our lives. And we mourn their loss because we mourn the loss of the relationship. Because we love much, 
we also suffer much at their passing. So I think it is safe to say that the disciples' time with Jesus was the happiest time of their life. The same is true with William Miller's prediction of October 22nd, 1844. Yes, William Miller made a mistake. He had the right time, but the wrong application. He had the wrong event, but this did not change the fact that something significant happened on October 22nd, 1844. It was a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. But instead of the second coming, Jesus had entered the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. This event signified, signified in that it was significant in that it, it initiated Jesus' end time ministry in the last days. And we eventually figured that out. Like the disciples, the followers of the Millerite movement were greatly disappointed. Maybe not as greatly disappointed as the disciples, but I think it would be similar. It was because the events leading up to October 22nd was a time of great joy. If you read some of the historical accounts of these people who had first-hand experience, they said stuff like, it was the happiest time of our life. Charles White, the great-grandson of James and Ellen White, states this, it wasn't just because they were anticipating him, but they loved him dearly. They had such a love for Jesus and a desire to be with him personally that it was a huge emotional letdown. When their early Adventists had completely focused and dedicated their lives on Christ, it was the happiest time of their lives. Nothing could compare to that wonder, that joy, that amazing experience. And we could say it's the same thing about the disciples. When they had focused their lives on Christ, when their, the object of their life was Christ, it was the happiest time of their life. I am reminded of what the Apostle Paul says in the book of Philippians, chapter 3, verse 8. He says, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ, Jesus my Lord. For whose sake I have lost all things, I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. Nothing compares to knowing and to live for Christ. Nothing. A friend once asked me not too long ago, I think it was about a year ago, and uh, he's a pastor too, and he asked me this strange question out of the blue. He asked me, if money was no object, what would you do with your life? What would you do? If money was no object, you had all the money in the world, what would you do with your life? For me, the answer was pretty clear. I told him, I would do that which makes me happy, which, which is, I will continue to pastor. And I can honestly say that serving the Lord has been the happiest moments of my life. Even, bef be, even before coming, be becoming a pastor, my fondest memories, my, uh, the, my fondest memories, my happiest times were that of when I was serving the Lord and when I put God first in my life. Now, I want to be clear here. I'm not saying that I have no faults because I have my own faults and then some. And I'm not saying that I have obtained because I am still striving like all of you. But what I am saying is that, that the, my, the, the experiences that I've had, the fondest memories, the happiest times are, are when I had completely dedicated my life to Christ. My Life Today, page 161. If you would find happiness and peace in all that you do, you must do everything in reference to the glory of God. If you would have peace in your hearts, you must seek earnestly to imitate the life of Christ. Those who in everything make God first and last and best are the happiest people in the world. Since October 22nd, 1844, 170 years passed. 
170 long years. And Jesus still hasn't come. And because he hasn't come, we are tempted to think of another solution to why Jesus hasn't come. We sometimes want to say, okay, maybe Jesus has already come. Maybe it means that, that Jesus has already come into your heart. Maybe that's the second coming. Or people, or, or people might have tried to say, okay, Jesus hasn't come for a long time. Maybe he still won't come for a very, very long time. And because of this perceived delay, which, and I say perceived because God does not delay. He has his own time. Our time is not his time. But because of this perceived delay, we have come, become too complacent in our lukewarmness. And I would dare even say we enjoy our lukewarmness and we are unwilling to compromise it. If I were to ask you a simple question, if you knew Jesus was coming tomorrow or the next week or even the next month, would you live your life in a different way? And I'm not necessarily talking about I would quit my job or I would give away my possession. I'm talking about your spiritual walk with God, your, spiritual, your spirituality. Would it look radically different if you knew Jesus was coming tomorrow or the next week? And for the most part, I think for most of us, the answer would be yes. Yes. If we knew Jesus was coming very soon, tomorrow or the next week, we would, there would be a radical change in our spiritual walks. But here's why I think we don't make Christ first in our lives. We often assume that if we were to radically change our spiritual lives right now, that we're going to miss out on something. We assume that our lives it, uh, would greatly diminish in some kind of joy or that our quality of life would suffer, why else wouldn't we radically change our lives toward God if we didn't think that? Maybe we don't do it consciously. But unconsciously, we, we believe to follow Christ would be a loss and not a gain. But I don't think anyone would argue here that heaven is worth attaining for. Because we all know that, that, that in heaven there is a great joy that awaits us there and that, that, our, and that our experience in heaven would be um, simply amazing and words would fail, fail us to describe how amazing heaven was. But the joy is not only in arriving at the destination but also in the journey itself. Please don't miss this point. Our experience, our walk with God, the joy is not in only arriving at heaven, that destination, but also in the journey itself as we go day by day through, through life. There is a great joy in walking with the Lord. The disciples experience this and they affirm this. The pre avenants of the great disappointments affirm this and believe this. The Apostle Paul confirmed this, and Jesus even alluded to this in many of his teachings. Do I believe that Jesus is coming soon? Absolutely. I believe that he's able to come in my lifetime. There are telltale signs in, of Matthew 24, how, how, how uh, these signs are happening more intensely and more frequently, just like Jesus said it would. And prophecy is unfolding before our very eyes. We see things in the news all the time that we can say, ah, that is a fulfillment of prophecy. But whether Jesus is coming in one day or one decade, there's no reason why we shouldn't make Christ the primary focus of our lives right now. Those who in everything make God first, last, and best are the happiest people in the world because there is a great joy in, in the journey itself. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we know that 
you have a great joy, unparalleled, waiting for us in heaven. But Lord, we can have a small piece of heaven right now as we walk with you. If we were to put you first in our lives, the primary focus of our lives, we know that it would be the happiest time of our lives because, Lord, that not only was it the experience of the disciples of the pre-Adventists, but, Lord, many of us have experienced the very same thing. But we also know there are challenges in making you first. So my prayer this morning is that, Lord, may the Holy Spirit work upon our hearts so that he can move us to make you first. first in our lives. Grant us the faith, the courage to do so. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the sacrifice of your son, Jesus. We pray these things in your name. Amen.